Good morning. Welcome and welcome on Valentine's Day. And glad to have each one of you with us. We have a few announcements uh, before we begin. First of all, as always, let's be good to each other and kind to each other as we practice good safety precautions. Um, and again, if anybody is short on masks or anything, we always have a pile that, uh, that Heidi Waddell Smith's uh, mask mission has provided for us, and we're grateful for that. Sunday school is going on, and we're glad for each one participating, and our teachers so faithful as that is, as that is happening. Youth group is not at 6.30, but rather today, because it's one of their mission Sundays. From 2 to 4 p.m., they are stacking the, uh, stocking the pantry, the food pantry. And everyone who's already contributed, thank you. But also, if you want to bring stuff by between 2 and 4, they'd be glad to have it. So thank you for that. Um, this is, we're, co we're coming on the beginning of Lent. We'll start a Lenten service uh, um, on our Sundays as well, a Lenten series. But also on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, we will have um, <clears throat> a beginning a cooperative service between about four churches of what we've called in the past Cranberry Council of Churches. And um, they're going to be entirely virtual. We know that some people may be uncomfortable about going to one church or the other. So they're going to be uh, virtual. We have a special Cranberry Council YouTube channel. But what we'll do is we'll post a link right from Facebook. So if you're used to taking, taking uh, advantage of those services by um, Facebook, you can just click there, or you can go to YouTube, search Cranberry Council, and that will be available. We're aiming for 7.30 p.m. on these services, and uh, again, they'll be, they'll be pre-recorded. In fact, I'm going to be recording uh, Wednesdays here after service today, so any folk who can help and um, stay a couple to help us do the tech for that, that'd be great. Um, next, next Sunday night will be our third Sunday of the month, relevant service, our contemporary service. We're very glad we've got some guest musicians coming down from uh, coming up from New Hope Church in Plymouth, who will be our worship band for the for the service, and very glad for that. It'll be a live service um, in our fellowship hall, and our interim acting uh, youth and family ministries director Sarah Feller will be our our message, bring our message for the day. We're glad for that. Um, the next Sunday is annual meeting. Now, we've done a church meeting under these uh, restrictions before. So we'll do it pretty similar to what we did that last time. We can meet. You can be here. You can be in the fellowship hall. Or you can participate via Zoom. We wanted to use Zoom so that folk can, um, can speak right to the meeting if necessary. So there will be, from the, uh, this upcoming church newsletter, there will be a link. If you want to participate by, via, by means of Zoom, just RSVP there. That way we will get to you the password so that we don't have any uh, crazy, uh, what do they call it, Z Zoom bombing or whatever things that, that, that have gone on and been troubled before. Uh, Lenten boxes, uh, it's nice to have folk come in asking after them during the week. Glad that this, uh, this Lent's collection will benefit the South Shore Women's Resource Center. Um, and thank you to everybody who participated in the Super Bowl. Um, the one with the O in it, the, uh, the, uh, the gathering for the food pantries. Still waiting to hear on the results of that. Um, we've had a good first two weeks for the uh, Psalm 23. A shepherd looks at the 23rd Psalm uh, Bible study. That's been Zoom-based. We've had participation from uh, uh, Cindy Cookson down in Florida, and her mom, Helen, will wave to us from time to time and say hello. So I know she misses you and looks forward to being back. Bob, have you started, Ruth, yet, or are you about to? Okay. Get into the book of Ruth. Very. So come and bring your questions, and we'll get them answered. There you go. And a very important book on a couple of different levels. Um, thank you for Shirley for her work as our collector, and um, if you'd like to uh, to get your envelopes, where are they? Are they there? Or yeah, okay, out by the office entrance there, or the, the outside door entrance says office. And if you can't get them, call Shirley at that number; she'll get them to you. Thank you for uh, Nick and Carol who are helping out with tech, and helping Frank and Frank's good work. And you can always use a couple more. So please see see Frank if you would be willing to learn and participate. 
especially if you are joining us by means of the uh, internet, we encourage you to go to the fcchanson.org website, click on connect, and uh, just drop us an, an email so that we can uh, know you're there and we can send you the newsletter. And folks who are watching us on Facebook, you can also just simply leave a, a uh, message, uh, comment, and we'll know that you're there. We can all say hi to you that way as well. Um, you can see us on Facebook Live, on YouTube, on the Whitman Hanson Community Access Channel, and audio CDs are available from the church office. So those are our services, our, our announcements for the morning. It's time for us to put our whole heart into coming into the presence of God and giving him the praise and worship. Let's allow the call to worship now to draw our hearts together. Good morning. Call to worship is Psalm 32, 1 through 7. Happy are those whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those whom the Lord imputes no inequity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my inequity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. Amen. I invite you now to stand and join me as we sing, You Are My King, Amazing Love. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you. 
amazing love. How can it be that you, my King, would honor die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my king. are my king. Jesus, you are my king. You are my king. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, die for me. <clears throat> Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, would die for Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you in all I do. I We remain committed to being there for one another, to being truly brothers and sisters in Christ, to caring for each other. And one of the easiest ways to do that in this crazy time of COVID is praying for each other. Glad for our prayer chain and for those who uh, pray by means of the, by sending us prayers, prayers at fcchanson.org, for Jane Clemens who keeps the list going so well distributes it all. Please continue to do that. Glad for Carol Gillis watching at home, but always available to pray with folks one on one. No one needs to go through any of this alone. Let's join in prayer. Lord, we thank you that your Grace is so strong. Your love for this world you made is so powerful that nothing interferes. You understood wireless communication long ago. And we do pray that you would not only attend to our prayers, but put your comfort and assurance on each one. But there would be no one who feels abandoned, or alone. We thank you, God, for answered prayers for Roz and for Laura, both who have been seriously ill, both now improving. We thank you that you answered prayers. We pray that you would have your healing touch upon Maria and Jeff Cole, who've had a serious car accident, that you would be healing Gloria as she recovers from heart surgery, and that you would give strength and encouragement to Yvonne, Gloria's daughter, Who's caring for her. Lord, let's put your hand upon Ginny Sears, who fell and broke the femur, her upper leg. Thank you that she's home recovering. Please be with her, with Bob. Help the uh, healing to be strong, good, and, and quickly. 
Would you be with Larry Martin, Martiniano, who is uh, going to have rotator cuff surgery? Cause it to work well. Put your hands upon all in the surgical team and his recovery. Let him know that you are with him, eager to, to be with them. Lord, put your comfort and encouragement on Skip, who uh, had his PTSD sort of triggered and from the Capitol riot, seeing those that footage. Thank you that he's home from hospital. Thank you that with strong medication, he's doing better. Please be with Jen as she helps him through this time, his wife, but also with many vets who've had a similar experience in recent weeks. Lord, our heart goes to our dear Walter Engstrom's brother, Carl, who's an end-stage pancreatic cancer. Thank you that Carl has a strong faith in you and help him, Lord, in these last days on this earth to experience with your comfort, your presence, your encouragement, and help him as he speaks words of encouragement to his loved ones as well. Be with our Carl, with our Walter, and also with Karen as she waits for a surgery. Be her strength too, we pray. God, I want to thank you that for the first time, and I don't know how long, there was no one that we were aware of with a COVID case to pray for. We're sure there are others. We ask that you be with them. But we thank you also for vaccine distribution. I thank you that my mother got her first shot this week that her only side effect was some pain in the arm. Pray that you would minimize that and continue to make these uh, vaccines something that helps mitigate the effects and uh, lessens the occurrences, and especially the serious and, and, uh, and fatal ones. Let there be equity and justice, we pray, in this distribution. And would you put your hands upon those making these kind of decisions? We ask, Lord, for your comfort to be upon the family and friends of Steve Walcott in East Bridgewater. We ask that you give unity and peace of mind to all families, especially for Cecile and her family. We pray for our, our Christian brothers and sisters in the country of Myanmar, the military dictatorship that is has taken over and uh, supplanted democracy. We especially pray for people from Myanmar who have been taking part in the video Zoom services of our New Day Church in Quincy, some of whom have disappeared since the time of this uprising. Would you pray, Lord, for you to give progress to Coralie and Celine in, the, uh, in their desire to move and reunite the family down in Florida? And for all school children, Lord, we ask you give them peace, that you give them a sense of comfort, that friends would be able to be friends. We pray for effective ministry to the homeless, for our young people to grow up healthy, for forces in the world that are not healthy, to be brought down, and that all those in authority, those who have influence, those with responsibilities, indeed all of us, might humble ourselves before you and do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with you. We join our prayers together as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, everyone. You know, none of us thought this would be as long as this has been. And the church has been supported 
by you who are here, you who are watching, many. And we are very grateful for that. But we all know that together, as brothers and sisters in Christ, God has a mission for us. So thank you. We know folk just give right in the baskets here. Folk mail them to their offerings to the church or, or drop them off during the week. You can go online, use the donate tab at our, at our website. And folk can use the, the uh, Breeze app to give as well. Thank you for all that you do. Let us offer to God our offerings of our heart and our lives. Let's sing and even stand as we do. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Ask and it shall be given unto Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Amen. Please be seated. Morning's reading is from Acts 13, 26 through 39. My brothers, you descendants of Abraham's family and others who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. Because the residents of Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize him or understand the words of the prophets that they that are read every Sabbath, they fulfilled those words by condemning him. Even though they found no cause for a sentence of death, they asked Pilate to have him killed. When they had carried out everything that was written about him, they took him down from the tree, laid him in the tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, and they are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As to his rising from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy promises made to David. Therefore, he has also said in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One experience corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, died, was laid beside his ancestors, and experienced corruption. But he whom God raised up experienced no corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, my brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. By this Jesus, everyone who believes, everyone who believes is set free from all those sins from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. This is the word of the Lord. Setting there is Paul speaking in a synagogue and letting people know how they could begin over again. Some, it's Valentine's Day. Sometimes 
love needs to start over again, especially in a marriage. The 2008 movie Fireproof was a surprise hit. In it, married couple Caleb and Catherine Holt, a fire captain and a hospital administrator, respectively, are experiencing marital difficulties. And at work, Caleb unders underscores the importance of never leaving one's partner behind. But at home, he and Catherine argue constantly. Catherine accuses Caleb of being selfish because he prioritizes his desire for a $24,000 fishing boat over paying for the medical expenses of Catherine's ailing mother. She's also frustrated that he has a habitual use of internet pornography. Caleb feels underappreciated, undervalued. Their constant arguing escalates to the point that Catherine demands a divorce to which an enraged Caleb agrees. Now Caleb's best friend and fellow firefighter, Michael, wonders why Caleb would charge into a burning building to save a stranger, but won't make any effort to save his marriage. Caleb's father, John, convinces him to hold off on divorce proceedings. And John persuades Caleb to try the Love Dare, a 40-day challenge for marriage improvement, in which a spouse alters the way they treat their partner. Caleb reluctantly agrees, though he decides not to tell Catherine. And at the hospital where she works, she's been openly flirting with a staff physician. Caleb begins the love dare half-heartedly. And when no quick changes happen in his wife's affection, he's ready to give up. But Michael tells Caleb he needs to learn how to love from the source of love. He says, you can't give what you don't have. You've got to beg God to teach you to be a good husband. Reconciliation doesn't come for them without sacrifice, but when it comes, it's beautiful. When was the last time you heard today referred to as Saint Valentine's Day? It seems to have disappeared oddly, hasn't it? Well, Valentinus was a pastor in the third century, and he developed a reputation for helping pure-hearted men and women find each other for marriages of lifelong faithfulness. Now today, those who would remove the Christian underpinnings from our culture have allowed the day to, let's say, get out of hand. When we become slaves to our emotions, what begins as rapture quickly turns to destruction. Emotions, though thrilling, will destroy us unless we learn to master them. And I admire the Kendrick brothers. They produced the fireproof movie. And, I, and all people who will, they endeavor to strengthen the presence of Christian virtues, in this case, principled love, in our modern day life. In marriage, as in all areas of life, we may be tempted to give up. But there is hope. And our passage from Ezra, the last one in this quick five-week series, it demonstrates that beginning over successfully requires a complete change of heart that only God can give. I'd like to read to you now from Ezra chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. Ezra is praying in front of the assembled nation at the newly rebuilt temple. Oh my God, I am too ashamed and embarrassed to lift my face to you, to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the, way, from the days of our ancestors to this day, we've been deep in guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our king, and our priests have been handed over to the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame, as is now the case. But now, for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God, who has left us a remnant and given us a stake in his holy place in order that he may brighten our eyes and grant us a little sustenance in our slavery. 
for we are slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to give us a new life, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, to give us a wall in Judea and Jerusalem. And now our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants the prophets, saying, the land you are entering to possess is a land unclean with the pollutions of the people of the lands, with their abominations. They filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons. Never seek their peace or prosperity so that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such a remnant as this, Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you destroy us without remnant or survivor? O oh Lord, God of Israel, you are just. But we have escaped as a remnant, as is now the case. Here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can face you because of this. 80 years have passed since the beginning of the book of Ezra, where we read of King Cyrus's decision to permit the rebuilding of the temple. And now today's passage, where for the first time we hear from the author, Ezra himself. The children of Israel stood at the threshold of a new beginning, a new beginning for their country. And as they listened attentively to their leader, Ezra spoke a strong word, which, if followed, would guide them to success in what lay ahead. For us to hear God's word to us in Ezra's prayer, we need to understand what they had gone through. Ezra understood that when we respond to the mighty acts of our holy God with a heartfelt pledge of pure allegiance, God will make all things new. A lot had happened bring the people of God together in the rebuilt temple. The trouble had begun with a loss of affection. The people had lost their first love for God, love they had shown when he freed them from slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt. As wealth and prowess precipitated their falling to temptation, their hard hearts had sunk all Israel. Assyria and Babylon, the empires that overran first northern Israel, then southern Judah. They appeared unconquerable. Then it seemed to get worse. The Persians had conquered both of those empires. But never count God out. A young Jewish woman named Esther had first caught the eye of the Persian king and then changed his heart. Mary McPherson was saying Thursday night in our Bible study, that she hopes to teach from that amazing Old Testament book, Esther, when she starts her class up again. Now, I don't want to do any spoilers there, but read that book and see if you don't find a good explanation for how the Jews' status in the eyes of their conquerors changed from despised to favored. I think it's a key piece of information and evidence. Under Cyrus, the Jews received permission to begin rebuilding. Under Darius, that permission was affirmed in spite of political pressure to overturn it. And now, under King Artaxerxes, they receive extraordinary assistance. I'm fascinated that we wait until chapter 7 of the book of Ezra to meet Ezra. We find there that Ezra has a lineage that goes all the way back 16 generations to Aaron, Moses' brother, the first high priest. Ezra had been in Babylon. Then we find a letter from King Artaxerxes granting Ezra everything he would need to rebuild the temple. Fully financed, up to 100 talents of, serve, of silver. Remember some parables about 10 talents and so forth, right? Well. 
a hundred talents of, of silver is equivalent to 2,000 years wages. If you put today's average wage, let's say, let's say 50,000 to make the math easy, well then you get a very large number. It was clear that God's grace had revived them. And it's not just a matter of going back to the land. It's going back determined to start over and to do it right this time. I kind of feel that we're all ready to go back into the land. <laughs> Are we going to be ready? Ezra doesn't want them to miss this opportunity. His prayer is filled with tears and repentance. And it's filled with we and us. He owns his own part in the moral decline of his people. He's begging God that they not fail again. And if the people are paying attention, if they have any spiritual sensitivity left in them, they have tears as well. They recognize that they could fall away just as easily as their ancestors did. Ezra's prayer helps them realize they had to choose heartfelt obedience. So why is Tuesday the day for Mardi Gras? I mean, the name means, anybody? Fat Tuesday. The title arose from the tradition of eating one last fatty, indulgent meal before the beginning of the Lenten season on Ash Wednesday. And I dare say quite a few folk uh, follow the carnival without ever paying attention to Lent. Lent's a sacred season of seeking spiritual growth through repentance and devotion. But indulgence is the current attitude out there. Now how can I stand here and say the only wise choice is repentance? You know, we've all heard the definition of insanity as doing the same thing over and over again, yet somehow expecting a different outcome. If we respond to affluence with indulgence, we will make a shipwreck of our lives. We need to listen to God. If we want to celebrate that Easter means hope beyond the grave, we need to remember Christ's death respond with appropriate self-examination. Lent's a good thing. Do the work before the party. The power of God is revealed in his prophetic word. I want to set this up properly. You know that expression, you had one job? <laughs> when the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, sought to provide a new calendar for the world, instead of the one that dated back to uh, honoring the often despicable Roman emperors, a monk by now the name of Dionysius was charged with the research. Dionysius let the year A.D. 1 start one week after what he believed to have been Jesus' birthday. But Dionysius' calculations, no. Nah. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that Jesus was born during the reign of King Herod, Herod the Great, who died in 4 BC. So yes, Christ was born four years before Christ. Now, we all know there are limits to human intelligence, human wisdom. Most scholars have settled on Jesus starting his earthly ministry, age 30, in 26 AD. Now, my point, is the power of God's prophetic word. You had to know that part to get to this part. The book of Daniel is written early in the Babylonian captivity, about 538 B.C. In chapter 9, verse 25 of his book, we read, Know and understand this, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. Well, sevens of what? Years, certainly, is what fits the context. Seven, seven, sixty-two sevens, sixty-nine sevens, 483 years. Now, Artaxerxes' decree to fully restore and rebuild Jerusalem 
comes in 458 BC. So if you treat BC like a negative number, 483 years, those 69 sevens, minus 458 BC, you get AD 25. So did God get it that close, but missed it by that much? Not at all. There is no year zero. 1 BC is a year before Christ. Then Christ is born, and it is the first year of our Lord, 1 AD. There's no year zero. So 483 years after 458 BC is, bang, 26 AD. The year the anointed one, the Christ, comes and begins his public ministry. The word of God is powerful. Prophecy reveals the power of God. God's word is spirit breathed. We dare not ignore it. Beginning over successfully requires a complete change of heart. The Bible's word for repentance indicates that we need to go beyond our current mindset to a new one. And that's what Ezra was seeking for his nation. Instead of just talking about Judah here, Ezra's got all 12 tribes of Israel in view. The people needed to reunite with God as their king. One of the great causes for Ezra's heartbreak is this ticklish issue of mixed marriages. And this isn't cultural bias, because, you know, Ruth, that, that Bob's group will be studying, is King David's great-grandmother. She was born a Moabite, a foreigner, but she chose to believe in Israel's God after experiencing her Jewish mother-in-law, Naomi's, gracious kindness. What mattered to God was when his children acted as if ultimate allegiances don't matter. You know, famous cricket player in England, C.T. Studd, said, if Christ is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. What's happened has happened. God can convert both parties in a marriage, or the one that yet did not believe at the time of the wedding. But it's no reason to choose marrying someone with a different view of ultimate priorities at the start. You know, don't act desperate. Let God lead you to a true life partner. When it comes to a true change of heart, so that we can begin over again successfully, we can all too easily fall victim to the paralysis of analysis. You know, how do I know if I'm fully giving myself to God? Can't I say, haven't I said, I love you, Lord, one week and then be apathetic the next? Can I truly choose allegiance? It's that paralysis of analysis. This came up Thursday night in our uh, Zoom-based study on the 23rd Psalm. One woman said that her co-workers have said, I wish I had your faith. As Christians, we know that our wills have been corrupted. The change of heart we seek, only God can give. But what everyone can do, though, is ask for faith. God, if you're there, please show me so I can trust in you. God delights to answer that prayer. It's a dangerous prayer. <laughs> if people had no choice in their behaviors, then incentives and consequences would both be ineffective. You know, the only person who does not slow down when he sees a police car on the side of the road is someone who's parked. Incentives and consequences work. We may stumble, we may make bad choices, but if we ask God to change our heart, he will. He will draw us back. The only wise choice is repentance. Ezra knew the history of his people. As he stood before the gathered nation, he wanted their repentance to stick this time. If we want to begin over again successfully, we need to be training ourselves in lives of devotion. How, what do you train? Well, your mind. Your mind is a muscle. In early uh, 1955, Jill Kinmont, who's in the chair here, 
was the reigning national champion in the slalom and a top prospect for a medal at the 1956 World Olympics. Then she had a paralyzing accident. And in the movie based on her life, The Other Side of the Mountain, she's encouraged to have the same attitude toward her mind as she previously had toward her body. Put it into training. She became a teacher, had a long career. So are you giving your mind good fuel? Take a daily approach to Bible reading. Do so prayerfully, intentionally. Pray, Lord, speak to me through your word. Pray, what truth do you have for me to learn today? Pray, how should I live differently because of what I'm reading? Still have more our daily breads to help you get started. Again, on that table to my, to my left. We can also train our souls by paying attention to fellowship. You know, you can give a plant good, pure water, good food, but if the soil is barren and if the air is polluted, it ain't going to end well. We need to spend intentional time with heat people who will help us be at our best. A good environment is crucial. These are Christian believers who help secure that change of heart we are seeking. Jeff Lambus is a uh, Christian comedian in Minneapolis. He uh, taught me to ask, what are you and God working on? That's what a Christian brother or sister asks another. What are you and God working on? How can I help? We only get better if we focus on what matters. Still, un uninterrupted navel gazing is not healthy. A soldier on his own, without fellowship, if you will, is very vulnerable. But if a group of soldiers has only an inward focus, you know, maybe they're checking each other's uniform and playing cards, uh, if they have an inward focus and ignore their mission, they will soon be casualties of war. How are you advancing the kingdom of God? Where are you sharing the news of Jesus? Where are you working for justice and mercy? Where are you sharing love with a purpose? Paying attention to our mission by engaging in truly good activity makes good on the change of heart necessary to begin over again successfully. Three years ago, when I was a member of the Missions Council for our National Association of Congregationalists, we met on the campus of ECHO, a recommended national ministry in Fort Myers, North Fort Myers, Florida. ECHO is an acronym for Educational Concerns for Hunger Organization. And I loved what I learned about them. They say empty bellies and empty hearts lead to pain and suffering for individuals, families, and communities across the world. We believe that as active participants in the Great Commission and stewards of great agricultural knowledge, it is our duty to grow and make disciples. Their focus is on developing self-sustainable hunger solutions for small-scale farmers. On a 55-acre farm there in North Fort Myers, along with sites in South America, Africa, and Asia, they have ingeniously created many different climates and conditions to help them provide answers for those small-scale farmers around the world. ECHO regularly hosts interns and missionaries and residents. They are united by faith in Jesus Christ and by a desire to bring his love in both word and deed. They are gathered to defeat hunger. During that time there, I got to live and work among them for three days. And I experienced personally how they train their mind with good fuel, Bible study, pay attention to the personal environment of authentic Christian fellowship, and engage in God-devoted activity of a mission that responds to one of the world's great needs. Emotions, like a construction paper valentine, can fade. But God deserves the best of our life's efforts. We've all failed to be all that we ought to be in our devotion to our God. 
But Ezra makes it clear. God gives us chances to start over again. Beginning over again successfully requires a complete change of heart that only God can give. If we train ourselves and our lives in devotion, our Heavenly Father will see his purposes fulfilled and see us safely home. Let's pray. Lord, we just want to take some time before you in silence. Allow your spirit to search our hearts. Show us where we need to begin again. Lord, you deserve our best. We need your help to be who you made us to be. So would you come in and do that serious house cleaning? Would you help us to be more fully yours? In Jesus' name. Our hymn is Search Me, O God. This is a tune I wasn't as familiar with, although I think many of you know it better than I. It's 458 in the hymnal, if anybody's... Do you have hymnals? No. Well, it's number 458 anyway. <laughs> Here, just... I'll let you look at mine. All right, let's stand and sing. I guess I better lead it out strong then, eh? That's a great tune. Wrong one. <laughs> Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior.
O oh Lord, as we go forth from this place, let us at all times stay close to you. Indwell us by your spirit. Fill us with your grace and power. And help us to be your ambassadors to this world that needs you so. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Go in peace.